Good morning, my name is David. I'm also one of the pastors here, and I join Levi in welcoming you to worship this morning at Perdita Bay United Methodist Church. Would you please listen with your hearts and your minds to Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. Now the man knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have produced a man with the help of the Lord. Next she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a tiller of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel for his part brought of the firstlings of his flock their fat portions. Now the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is lurking at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must master it. Cain said to his brother Abel, let us go out to the field. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it will no longer yield to you its strength. You will be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Today you have driven me away from the soil and I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and anyone who meets me may kill me. Then the Lord said to him, Not so. Whoever kills Cain will suffer a sevenfold vengeance. And the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one who came upon him would kill him. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. This is the word of God for the people of God. We are in this sermon series on uh, things we don't like to talk about in church. And in the first of these uh, sermons, we talked about the sanctity of life and the biblical and theological issues around capital punishment and abortion and war. And then last week, the biblical and theological issues about divorce And next week, the biblical and theological issues surrounding debt, a condition that uh, many of us struggle with or know persons that struggle with it. This morning, though, is a little different. It's different because we're talking about an addiction or addictions. And while you can uh, experience a divorce in, in a certain kind of way and make a decision about life or about finances, addiction is a disease. But it's also not all that different than the other subjects, because while addiction may find itself in a nice little anecdote in a sermon, it usually doesn't get the whole focus of a sermon from the pulpit. And that's why it's part of this sermon series. I wanted to start with my grandmama. You've heard me, if you've been in worship with us a while, talk about my mom's mom. Uh, She was a joy-filled, fun woman to be around. I mean, she really was. She's the one that uh, I I just can't get out of my head. She taught me that TV wrestling was real and the moon landing was fake. I mean, that is the woman that she was. She, she, if she didn't believe it, she was convincing everyone else she believed it. And uh, she was very hard-headed, stubborn, you you might say. I, I live with two adolescents and she puts them to shame. I mean, she is so so stubborn. And even when she passed away, she had very specific ideas about how we were to um, bury her, handle her burial. She, she wanted to be cremated, and she wanted her ashes to be scattered in a very particular spot. It was a pond on the ninth hole of her favorite golf course. 
She had made several holes in one on this particular golf course, and uh, she's actually in the Alabama Sports Hall of Fame for her golf game, and, uh, and, and she was really clear that's what she wanted, and so she uh, left those instructions, and, and so my family, they called up the golf course, and they asked if we could do it the night before her service, and uh, the golf course said, no, we do not allow anyone to scatter human remains on our property, anywhere on our property, but see, the person talking uh, to my aunts and my mom didn't realize they were talking to mixing women who were just as stubborn as their mama was. And believe me, I know. I lived with one of them for a long time, 18 years of my life. And so they were going to do this no matter what they were told. But I'm a law-abiding citizen, and so I was not going to have any part of it. And I said, that's fine. I will do a service, you know, with the book of worship in a place where we're allowed to do it on the outside of the golf course. And uh, but, but I'm not going to do what it is you're planning to do. And so that night, all my family was there. It was, it was the day before the funeral service. I was doing my grandmother's funeral service and uh, the next morning. So I was kind of preparing and they come in and they say, hey, we're going to all go out to, to get ice cream or something. And so we get in the cars and we're in this caravan. And then I realize we're driving up to this business that's on the golf course. And my Aunt Shay had secured a key and the alarm code for this business, telling the owner what it was we would be doing. And without using flashlights or cell phones so as to not be detected, we snuck through this business and out onto the golf course. I'd only been a minister for three months, and so I, I did not understand anything about cremains. And um, I'm not trying to make light of something like this, but I didn't believe those ashes were really my grandmother. I mean, I knew in a spiritual way they weren't. And so um, it's the part of the service, my sister's holding the, the book of worship, where you're supposed to scatter the ashes. And you want to do this in kind of a holy way. So I, you know, reached down there and I kind of put a few of her ashes out in the pond. And I am so nervous on the inside because here we are in the pitch black darkness. We have one little bitty light so that I can see out of my book of worship. And, and I start to scatter her ashes and I realize you know, there are a lot of ashes. I mean, this isn't just a little thing. This is going to, I mean, what am I going to do here to make this seem holy? And right then, God opens up the skies, and it pours rain down on us like you would not believe. And rain in ashes is even more, you know, weird. And, and my leather-bound book of worship that my first church gave me is now getting soaking wet, but we're all standing there. We're going to finish this service just like Grandmama wanted until these two golf cart headlights start heading towards us. It was the security company. They were coming after us. My family has never run away from me as fast as they did in that moment. But I can't run. I've got her ashes, and I haven't done anything. And so I just said, sorry, Grandmama, and dumped her right there in the pond. She would have loved it, by the way. That's just who she was. She was a fun lady. She was also an addict. Alcohol was her choice substance. She buried a husband and a parent due to alcohol abuse, but it didn't stop her from putting down the glass. On my dad's side of the family, the struggle is prescription drug abuse, and so because I have substance abusers on both sides of my family, it makes me six times more likely to become an addict myself. My friend uh, Brian Erickson is a pastor at Trinity United Methodist in Birmingham, and he has this unscientific but really, I think, very helpful definition of addiction. He says, it's the thing you want that you don't want to want. Um, I, I found this after our uh, person who makes the slides went on vacation, so it would be up on the screen for you, but I'm just going to repeat it a few times. It's the thing you want that you don't want to want. I think that's a great way to understand addiction. In all of its forms, it is a catastrophic and destructive force in the life of families. And it's indiscriminate. It, it, it reaches across every religious group, every racial group, every nationality, it reaches across every social group, every economic group, every educational level. Addiction steals and lies and cheats. It threatens the lifeblood of communities. It is one of the most destructive forces I have ever run into 
in ministry. I have sat down with uh, families who are struggling with addiction and watched them make choices that throw away their families just because of their addiction. I, I have sat down with a dad before who had a gambling addiction and knew he knew he was going to lose all of his finances and his children if he kept it up, and he kept it up anyway. I have uh, friends that I went to school with from 3P all the way until I was 18 years old who have become homeless and imprisoned and even worse because of addiction. Addiction, it makes promises it cannot keep. It demands worship it does not earn. And it steals life that it cannot replace. On the surface, you'd think, hey, we're wise enough, right? I mean, we know what addiction does. We've seen its effects. So we're going to be exempt from becoming addicts ourselves. That's, that's what people think because we have this illusion that we can control everything our own selves. But see, that's what addiction does. It begins to uh, lie to you and to convince you to lie to yourself. I think that uh, the scriptural definition of addiction might be found by the Apostle Paul when he was writing to the Romans in chapter 7 and he said these words, I do not understand my own actions, for I don't do what I want. I do the very thing I hate. It's the thing we want that we don't want to want. Addiction takes our humanity from us. These people are in a battle every single day. And most of them are winning that battle, but it's day by day. And they come here to this church multiple times a day, every single day of the week, to pray for one another, to encourage one another, to support one another. Sometimes people will text me on a Saturday night and say, hey, what's happening at the church? What did I miss out on? Oh, that's our recovery groups. It's, it's one of the best things we have going at this church, and it just kind of happens without us even knowing it oftentimes. Do, do, I was walking out of this building Tuesday afternoon, and this fellow who was coming out of one of the meetings, he grabbed my attention. He said, hey, pastor, I just want you to know today was a great meeting. God was really present in our lunch meeting today. And I said, oh man, God's present every time I walk by that room. I know God is present there. And he put his hand on my shoulder and he said with all sincerity, no, David, you don't understand. This meeting has changed my life. I would not be alive today if it wasn't for this meeting that meets right here every day. The irony is that we know there are treatment programs. We know there are resources that can help someone struggling with addiction. But the problem is when we are the ones that are suffering with that struggle, it's so hard to realize it. It's really easy for us to point out addiction in other people. It's really difficult for us to notice it in ourselves, to take that first of the 12 steps. And honestly, it's the one that only you can do for yourself. It, it, it takes the person to realize that they have lost control. But you see, it's so hard to admit they've lost control because it would mean that the substance now is in control of our lives. And we don't want to admit that something else is controlling us. We don't want to change. Sin does not want to change. And I use the word sin intentionally. Because every kind of addiction, whether it's alcohol or drug use, or pornography, or gambling, or overeating, or undereating, every kind of addiction there is, and there are a lot more than that, it demands your trust. It becomes part and parcel of your whole life. It is where your attention is drawn. And that means we lose dependency on God or anything that is of the heart of God and his righteousness. And we begin to put our dependency on a substance or on a behavior. And that steals life that it cannot replace. It demands worship it did not earn. 
and it makes promises it cannot keep. Addiction is an outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual brokenness that we're all prone to. Take, for instance, alcohol. Scripture says that wine gladdens the heart, and we know that Jesus drank, despite what our Baptist friends try to tell us. I mean, he really did. He, he did actually turn water into wine, even though I know I've seen people who've tried to prove otherwise. It's just not true. He did. But Scripture also tells us that drunkenness is a sin, that, that too much of a good thing is where the problem begins, because it's not necessarily the thing itself or the behavior that it's a sin, it's the role that that begins to play in our lives, because we have this amazing ability as people to think we're in the steering wheel of our own lives, that we're in control. And so when that substance or that sin takes control of our lives and we begin to allow it to have that kind of control, that's when the behavior becomes destructive and keeps us from having the kind of life that God wants us to have and the kind of relationships that God wants us to have. And that takes me to our scripture today, which is a very odd scripture for a sermon about addiction. In fact, you may be thinking, did he read the wrong one before he started this sermon? But I think that Genesis tells us why the way things are the way they are, especially why we are the way we are, and how God is involved in all those whys. It's my own bias that I believe Genesis gives us the truth, truth about uh, my relationship with God, and your relationship with God, and our relationships with one another, and our relationships even with ourselves. And in this story in Genesis 4, we have the first story on the other side of sin. The first story outside of the Garden of Eden, that perfect place that God created. It's the first story after the fall. Adam and Eve have born a child, the first child born into humanity. There's all kinds of celebration and fanfare. He is named Cain, which means to receive or to create. This is wonderful, beautiful thing. And then comes Abel. He's the second child. He's named nothingness or vapor. That's what Abel means. There's not quite as much fanfare. I'm a first child, by the way. Cain is made a, uh, a, a tiller of the ground. And, and Abel is uh, a, a shepherd, a keeper of the flocks. And then it's time for the brothers to come to worship. And they both come and they bring their sacrifice to, to worship, to worship God. And God favors Abel's sacrifice over Cain's. And it's totally unfair. It it, it is. It's totally unfair. And God's going to make a lot of choices like that in Genesis. If you don't believe me, just sit down and read it. He's always choosing the wrong people and the wrong ways to get things done, at least according to our minds and our way. It's totally unfair. And all these theologians have written things, and I read them all again this week, to try to explain why uh, this might have happened the way it did. Well, maybe Cain didn't bring the first fruits of uh, of his ground like the first sheep was brought out of Abel. But that, that's just not there. You'd have to add that to the story to find it there. And so some will say, well, Cain's heart just must not have been in the offering. But that's not there either. What is there is that God, without cause or explanation, chooses Abel's sacrifice over his older brothers. And so while we're talking about a subject that we don't like to talk about in church, we're going to use a sermon we, in Scripture, oftentimes just try to explain away. And I think that they fit very well together because this seeming unfairness of God in the first story after the fall, I think, is teaching us exactly what life is going to be like. I mean, this is how life is going to go. Now that the world has fallen, now that there is sin in this world, life is unfair. Totally unfair. I mean, that's how this life is going to be. And, and, and we're given a choice of who or what we're going to trust when life gets unfair. We don't know if God said to Cain, your offering isn't as suitable as Abel's. We don't know how he found out. Maybe he just felt that way. But what we do know is that he got angry 
and his countenance fell. Uh, Another way of translating it is his face fell. He, I think, brought what he felt like was his best. And then he realized it wasn't good enough. You see, the question in this story, what we're learning is, life's going to be unfair, and it's not always going to make sense. Maybe it doesn't ever make sense. And the question is, how will we respond when life gets unfair? Will we respond in faith? You see, a faith response to the unfairness of life would be to take courage and trust God in His ways anyway. Or will we respond in sin? Sin is the way that we respond to the unfairness of the world by being destroyed by it and destroying others by it. Cain was a model for what not to do and who we should not become. Because when he got angry and his face fell, you know what I'm talking about. When you're so angry, you can't even see the road in front of you. When he got angry and his face fell, He became something he never thought he would be. He murdered his brother, the first murder in all of human history. I don't think Cain ever set out to be a killer. I don't think Abel ever did anything wrong to Cain. And yet, that's the choice he made. He lost sight of who he was. He wanted the thing he did not want to want. That's the definition of addiction. To do or to want the thing we don't want to want. You know what God says to Cain? Before he makes that decision. Sin is crouching at your door. The King James Version. The version I read is sin is lurking at your door. But I like crouching better. Because that's how I picture it. Crouching at your door, God says to him. Waiting. And as soon as unfairness came into this world, as soon as things went differently than we thought they would go, he let that sin in. God says you can master it, but it's lurking, crouching at your door. It's waiting for all of us to see if we're going to be our better selves To take an action of faith or to take an action of sin. This is how sin works. I don't think anybody on their wedding day says, you know what, one day I'm going to cheat on my spouse. I, I don't. I don't think anybody that's a high schooler picks up a beer at a party and drinks it and thinks, I hope to be an alcoholic one day. I I don't think that anyone holds a baby in a hospital and says, you know, I'm going to spend all my time and all my money on my addiction rather than on my child. Or someone takes a pill after a surgery and says, I want to spend every waking moment hiding and stealing so that I can keep taking this pill. Sin eases us into the hot furnace It slowly draws us into the fire, one compromise after another. That's how sin works. It is slow and it is deliberate and it seems harmless, but it keeps us from doing what we know is right. And then when we get angry, oh, it's been crouching, it's been lurking, it's been waiting. It's ready to come into our hearts. And once we let it in, it's almost too late at that point. Because then we start lying for it. And denying it. And making excuses for it. And pretending like it's not even there. But God is inviting Cain in this moment to be self-aware. To reflect on who he really is and the kind of decision he wants to make. People who are in recovery are some of the most self-reflective people I have ever met. They really are. I mean, they they are always self-examining themselves. They are the people that know the devil is at every door just waiting, so you have to be vigilant. And they have to be, because do you know that the Surgeon General also said in this study that I read that addiction is a pediatrically acquired disease in 90% of its cases. That means 90% of the cases, the person used the substance they are addicted to before they were 18 years of age. And the risk factors for addiction, the risk factors that make someone more susceptible to being a a, a person struggling with addiction, are 
all things that are outside of our control. It seems just like Genesis chapter 4. They're all things that are totally unfair. Learning disabilities, behavioral problems, psychological disorders, trauma like abuse or divorce or bullying, stress and the feeling of inadequacy and insecurity, the quality of parenting and genetic history. These are the risk factors of addiction. So you have to be self-aware. You have to be a self-examiner so that you can realize who you are and what you want that you don't want to want and be able to make the right and good choices for yourself and for your loved ones. One of the first people I met when I moved to Montgomery right out of seminary was a guy about my age. He had already been married and started his family. He was a great businessman. He was a wonderful churchgoer. We, we started a quick friendship, and a few weeks into our friendship, he said, David, I want to confide in you and tell you something. I'm an alcoholic. Do you know how I responded? I tried to talk him out of it. <laughs> That's how stupid I was about addiction. I tried to convince him he was not an alcoholic because I knew how al- alcoholics behaved and what they looked like, and he didn't look like any of that. If He was able to tell me the story of how he had enough self-awareness to know himself that before his addiction destroyed his life, he drug it out into the light and got the help and support he needed. It takes an unbelievable amount of countercultural spiritual awareness to be able to respond in faith and not let a substance control you. But it can be done. If you can name the thing that is breaking you. But we don't like to name our sins. We don't like to name the things that we struggle with. The things that are vying for control of our lives. We have to ask ourselves, if we're struggling with something, if you're struggling with something this morning, ask yourself, are you doing something that you don't want to do? Do you want something that you do not want to want? Does the action, the behavior that you exhibit, do you think it really pleases God? Does it even really please yourself? And do you have someone you trust that you can tell, that you can name, or even God himself, can you name your struggles? There are so many resources for help. So many. Even right here at this place, we know of resources. If you want help, if you're seeking help, let me tell you this, there is recovery. There is hope. I have seen it in some of the most devastating of life's circumstances. People with the help of God and others be able to overcome the final demise that addiction was taking them. This summer, Elizabeth and I um, have a friend that lost a 26-year-old. It was strange when he died because it seemed so sudden and we had no idea how it happened. We didn't know, is this a car accident? Did he take his life? I mean, all these kinds of questions because it seemed so hush about how he had passed away. And then his younger brother posted something on Facebook. This was a, a kid I had in confirmation that... Um, I love and uh, helped work with through his spiritual life. He wrote these words, Two nights ago, my brother died of a fatal drug overdose. Will has struggled with addiction on and off for the past eight years. He was 26 years old. This picture, and it's one that he posted on Facebook with this post, is the last good memory I have with Will. This was in February. He came to Tuscaloosa to visit a longtime sober friend of his and to visit me. Will was on a streak of sobriety that seemed promising. We went out to lunch, we threw the frisbee on the quad, and I got to show him where I go to school. Even though he was a lifelong Auburn fan and his college career was cut short due to his addiction, he was so happy for me. For the first time in a long time, everything felt normal. I know most people didn't know or don't know how Will died, but he would appreciate this honesty because he hated the stigma surrounding addiction. Will always wanted to help people that were struggling, especially people facing the same battles as him. I don't think in Will's heart he wanted to be this person. I think he wanted to marry a nice girl, start a family, 
I think he wanted to stop living a life that hurt the people he loved. I think he wanted to stop lying to his friends and his parents and his brothers and sisters. God invites Cain to examine his heart, to see what's broken inside. And then he makes a promise. Cain makes a decision that leads to destruction. It's not a good one. He responded in sin to the anger and the unfairness of life. But God makes him a promise that he is not going to be defined by what he has done. That is our God, friends. Our God is so full of mercy that Cain will be more than what he has done and the choices that he has made. Yes, he will be scarred by his sin. But God protects him and marks him and tells him you are more than your mistakes. You are more than what you have done. Every single Sunday we gather in this place, we come to hear that. That our Savior, Jesus Christ, accepts us where we are and wants us to have a new start for a better today and a brighter tomorrow. A place where we come to know we are forgiven and where we are made new. That's who we worship. Not because you can do it on your own, but because Christ went to a cross So that he will join you in the struggles of this life. And by the power of his Holy Spirit, you may be made new and set free. Addiction will lie, cheat, and destroy. Tear you apart. It will make promises it cannot keep and demand worship it does not earn. And it will steal life that it cannot replace. But Jesus Christ, friends, he makes a promise that is eternal. He demands worship that brings hope. He offers a life of redemption. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.